Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Joseph Woodbury is the founder and CEO of Neighbor.com, a marketplace disrupting the $400 billion self-storage industry. Prior to Neighbor, he worked for Bain & Company and Sorensen Capital, as well as for the Senate Majority Leader in Washington, D.C. So Joseph, I'm excited to have you on today and uh, to learn about Neighbor and uh, everything that you guys are up to. How are you doing today? Doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, you know, I think uh, this is actually, I think uh, you guys have been on my radar for a while and, uh, you know, I'm always interested to learn about, I would say anything, you know, kind of in the gig economy, sharing economy, marketplaces. I think that there are a lot of aspects of each, you know, that of course, you know, whether it's ride share or scooters, you know, there's gonna be certain aspects that are minimized uh, or maximized, but I think at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the same principles apply. So uh, for those who haven't heard of, neighbor can you give us kind of the 60 second uh, elevator pitch on what it is and kind of what makes you guys so awesome yeah so neighbor is just a way to share space within your neighborhood um, and specifically for storage whether it's someone looking to store their boat on the side mm -hmm. of your house or their boxes in your garage or in your basement it's a way to take that excess unused space that you have in and around your home and monetize it yeah. And I think uh, I saw on one of the, uh, sh the the one sheets I've seen about you guys, it was the Airbnb for storage. So obviously I'm assuming you guys created that. So I'm assuming you like that uh, term or that uh, that phrasing, right? Yeah, it's very similar concept. In fact, we have a lot of people that are Airbnb hosts and they're monetizing mm. that livable space. You know, they're renting out all their excess bedrooms, yeah. but then they have no way to monetize that garage space or that shed space or that basement mm. space. And so they'll they'll rent that out on neighbor as well to maximize their cash flow. Yeah, and that was one of the interesting things that stood out to me immediately is that, you know, for people who maybe don't want to have strangers in their house, uh, you know, I saw someone was listing their bedroom here in Los Angeles that you could actually, you know, rent out their bedroom, not to live in, but, you know, to store your stuff. And I thought that was kind of a cool concept because it minimizes, you know, some of that potential friction, I guess you would say, of, you know, like an Airbnb owner who has to worry about cleaning and, you know, just, I guess, just at a, a more basic level, having some stranger in your house every night. Yeah, we actually, for, there's especially a, a certain demographic, we get a lot of people that come to us and say, hey, my friends have been telling me to use Airbnb for a while now, um, but I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with the invasive nature of it, yeah. but I'm an empty nester and I do have some excess space in my home and I'd like to monetize that to supplement my social security or something mm -hmm. like that. And so Neighbor's a great solution. And it, I think in general, it highlights an interesting differentiator for us, and that is that it's very passive income. Mm -hmm. um, up until this point, the, the gig economy has taken on these these active roles, which are awesome, right? Like yeah. you can drive around your Uber and make a, a lot of money doing that, or your door, you know, work for DoorDash, et cetera. But neighbor is an opportunity to make some income without really doing any work. Um, yeah. it's, it kind of sits in the background. Someone will come drop their boat off at your house and you, you don't see them again for like a year until they need it the next summer. But every single month you're getting that direct deposit into your yeah. bank account. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, online marketers or bloggers who I've sort of studied over the years and really learned all my all my secrets from is uh, named Pat Flynn. And he runs a site called Smart Passive Income. And uh, it's funny, though, because a lot of the he's a very honest guy. And a lot of the times, you know, it, it, everyone's interested in this, you know, sort of elusive passive income. But basically, 99% of the time, whatever you think is passive income kind of ends up not being that passive, right? <laughs> and I think real that's estate right. is, a, is the perfect example of that right that if you own a uh, property and you're renting it out it's kind of anything but passive most of the time or some of the time and i think airbnb is even more extreme it's basically you know every night or every few nights there's turnover and there's something you need to deal with so it's definitely not passive in that sense but i, I guess you guys are i don't know if it's completely passive obviously there's still a little bit of work but it's definitely more on the slider of passive income than probably other real estate opportunities right yeah, it is. It is kind of that rare, uh, rare passive opportunity where 
the things people are storing, you know, if you look at the storage industry as a whole, mm-hmm. um, the, the largest player is a company called Public Storage. And mm-hmm. their average duration for a user in a unit is like 36 months. Wow. Um, and, and even the smaller mom and pop storage facilities have average durations of 14 months. Mm-hmm. So it really is an opportunity for you know, you to generate that truly passive income because they're going to come and stay for the long term. And the other thing that, you know, help helps kind of uh, build that story as well is people don't tend to store items that they need access to on a frequent basis. Mm-hmm. You know, so when we look at our platform, the average user is accessing their items like once every six months, roughly. Mm-hmm. So it really is kind of once you're set up, there's some work to be done, yeah. you know, getting them moved in, getting getting the boat, you know, put in your garage or the boxes in your basement. But once it's there, it is that truly passive income. Yeah, that's a good point because that was going to be my my next question is, you know, are you going to have any kind of midnight, you know, knocks on your door from your renter <laughs> saying, "Hey, I need to get this out of my out of my <laughs> out of my box in your bedroom." And you're like, "Dude, it's 2 or 3 a.m. Why are you knocking on my door?" Yeah. How does that uh, how does that work? I guess like the interactions between hosts and uh, renters. Yeah, so each host, when they're signing up their space, we will ask them a series of questions. And one of those questions is, how frequently do you want to allow renters to access their items? Gotcha. And there's a number of different options. We have, you know, we have small businesses that rent out uh, excess space in their office, mm-hmm. and they will select the option to say, you know, you can business hours access, you can come during Got business it. hours anytime you want. But homeowners often select the option of, you know, by appointment only. So you need to message me in advance, you know, several days in advance. That can all be set up through the app, uh, and and we'll find a time that's convenient for the host uh, for you to come visit your items. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah, no, it sounds like uh, not the most difficult uh, problem in the world to solve, but it sounds like you guys have obviously been thinking about it. So if I'm someone thinking about hosting and, you know, obviously in these, uh, you know, economic times, I think everyone is looking to make a little extra money. Um, you know, how much money do you think I can make renting out my space? Yeah, it, it completely depends on the type of user you want to be. I'd say the mm-hmm. average, uh, the average user who's just passively kind of finding a, a little little space in their home that's unused is yeah. going to make two two thousand uh maybe more dollars per year okay uh, but we we have users that make twenty thousand dollars a year mm. on the platform so uh, and, and those tend to be the the more active hosts where yeah. they're listing multiple spaces uh, around their home yeah and oftentimes you do have those spaces that you just don't you just don't realize you do we will send out as part of our service you'll see when you sign up as a host we offer free photography services Mm. and we'll send out a photographer um, free of charge. And oftentimes when that photographer goes to visit this space, they will point out other spaces Mm. that uh, that potential host can rent. And the host is like, Oh, I didn't even think about that space that that could be monetized. And instead of listing, you know, one uh, just kind of nook or cranny, they'll end up listing two or three spaces and, and the income just starts to build. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you're talking about spaces, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about bedrooms, but are we talking also, you know, are we talking like one corner of the house or, you know, under, you know, a linen closet or how how small, I guess, can we get here? (laughs) A safe, you know, maybe even a safety deposit type, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, um, A lockbox or something like that, uh, that you might have in your house. We we certainly have um, spaces as small as a closet go up and, and that can be very convenient for a certain type of user. If you think of like a student who is going on an internship for a summer mm. and needs to store their items somewhere, a closet is really all they need. Yeah. You know, they have four boxes that they can put in a closet. And then we have spaces as big as, um, oftentimes people have land next to their home. Mm. Uh, they'll have like an empty lot and they'll list that lot and we'll put, you know, yeah. an RV and a boat on that lot and they can really start to make income mm. off of that. And there's really no platform out there today to monetize that but Naver. 
Yeah, and that's interesting because you know I think in the in the gig economy, as I sort of know firsthand, you know there's a lot of variability, and it was a li it's a little bit of an unfair question to ask. You know, how much money can you make, right? Because there's so many different options, but it's something someone people always ask me about Uber and Lyft drivers, and I think that there's less, you know, in the gig economy, like from a worker's perspective, if you're driving for Uber and Lyft or delivering food, you know, I think that there's less uh, variability because you know you're still sort of doing the same job at the end of the day. But I do tell sure. people, you know, frankly, like we've seen, you know drivers with more experience make five dollars per more per hour right um those that kind of know what they're doing can make more money those that are like signing up for the best services the you know the quickest and getting the best bonuses and you know staying on top of all that can and i think that's one of the the cool things about the gig economy and with a service like yours is that you know, the average person might be making $2,000 a month, but, or $2,000 a year, sorry. Um, but if you have, you know, some extra space or if you're willing to get creative or if you kind of understand, you know, the needs of the users in this community, you can do, you know, much better. So I'm curious to know what kind of dictates the higher earnings. Is it the, you know, like, what are the two or three main things that maybe dictate higher earnings for hosts? Is it the city that they live in? Is it the type of space they're renting out or, you know, physically, you know, the more, you know, like a big piece of land. If you have more space to rent out, do you get more money for that? Yeah, and you'll see when you sign up, uh, our, most most hosts have no idea how to price their their mm -hmm. space. And so as you put in your city, as you put in uh, the size of your space, as you put in the features, like does it have uh, security cameras? Mm -hmm. Does it have smoke detectors? Oh, interesting. Does it have a separate locked entrance? Um, the algorithm will suggest a recommended price that you can follow or, or not follow, it's it's basically up to you. But but that price basically gives you a 90% greater, greater likelihood of mm -hmm. getting rented. Got it. Um, you know, we, we've watched what gets rented in that city. So yeah, you're right, it, it absolutely depends on the city. Um, but of course, uh, you know, it, it's gonna track pretty closely to, uh, you know, income levels as well, right? So you know, if you're in a city like San Francisco, income levels are going to be higher, but you're going to make mm -hmm. more on neighbor. Uh, if it. you're in a more suburban market like Utah, uh, you're going to make less on neighbor, but but it's going to be about okay. the same share of your income. Got it. So sort of the number one determinant, I guess, you know, across the board is kind of the city that you're operating in. And obviously, you know, most That's people right. probably aren't going to move, you know, across the country to, um, you know, maybe, you know, San Francisco to, you know, start their neighbor. Although, you know, we have heard of drivers, you know, moving from like Florida to San Francisco. So you never know um, to drive depending on, you know, people's situations. Are there any other kind of big factors that affect how much so a host might earn? Yeah, the, the other factors are, um, well, there's kind of the the basic factors and and those are again the location mm -hmm. and the size right okay. if you think about any real estate market it's it. it's location 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 and then and then the number of the amount of square feet you have to offer but when you get into like who does well on our platform mm -hmm. um, the the major things that matter are you know nice photos those spaces get rented the fastest and they stay rented the longest uh, because the the renter is able to envision the space mm -hmm. they're getting into there you know we we had it we had a question when we got into this whether renters mm -hmm. were going to value those photos because it's less of an experience yeah. like an airbnb they're not and staying there they're just a, putting their junk there right <laughs> they're just putting their stuff there exactly but they do it's it's one mm -hmm. of the most statistically significant factors on our site um, in fact you're you're more than twice as likely to be rented if you have four photos or more on our site. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's one of the things that that we share with all of our hosts, just, just creating that visual experience because these items that people are storing are items that they value, mm -hmm. right? Like they they could, anything that, you know, you would classify as, as you know, quote unquote junk, most renters are just gonna throw that away, yeah. right? They, they are storing, they are paying That's to store point. these items <laughs> because they want, you know, because they value them yeah. and they want to keep them. And so being able to visualize that space and see that it's a nice space that, that's taken care of. And, and a lot of times these are high dollar items, right? Mm -hmm. We store, um, you know, one of the more common items stored on our platform is like classic cars, right? Oh, we, wow. we get, you know, 69, uh, Camaros and Corvettes mm -hmm. and you know all these classic cars or boats, right? These are boats that people pay you know fifty thousand dollars a 
fifty thousand dollars to purchase, and then they're storing um, on the on the platform. So, so that's I think the single biggest determining factor, and then the responsiveness. Oftentimes, rentals will come on and they'll look at your space, yeah. and then they'll look at a couple more spaces close to you. Um, and it's those hosts that are kind of engaged in the platform and are very responsive mm -hmm. and answer questions quickly that the renters decide to go with because they feel comfortable, you know, transacting with that that yeah. person. Yeah, it makes sense. And I mean, you talked about sort of the value of the items that people are storing. And I think you brought up a, a good point. You know, I probably as the host look at it as junk, but <laughs> the uh, person, you know, that's renting this space for me, I mean, that's really, like you said, that's the reason why they're renting this space because they value it. Maybe it has sentimental value or, you know, some perceived value, uh, you know, monetarily or whatever it is. I did notice on your site, you have a $25,000 protection because that would sort of be what I'm thinking, you know, am I putting myself at any risk, uh, uh, liability wise, you know, I'm assuming in, in a bedroom type situation, there probably isn't going to be anything, you know, that $25,000 might cover me. But if I'm storing someone's, you know, 69 Camaro or Corvette, I'm assuming that's worth a lot more than $25,000, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think it's worth calling out how unique that is in the storage industry. Mm -hmm. Most people, I don't, I don't think are aware, but when you store your items in a, a storage, you know, a, a commercial storage facility, those items are not insured. Oh, really? Right. The the if the place you know burns down, you're completely on the hook mm. for your items. Even if it's burglarized. Are, even if it's burglarized mm. or anything, like you're literally just renting a spot to put your items. Mm. Uh, it, it's it's the the storage industry is very poorly serviced that way, mm. and that's because there's there's so much more demand for storage than there is available supply. And so the storage facilities kind of set the rules. Mm -hmm. And there's some facilities out there that will go, you know, an, another step beyond that. And they will offer like a third party insurance policy mm -hmm. that you can tack on on top of your storage contract. So I pay $400 a month for my storage unit. And then for an extra $15, $20 a month, I can get $5,000 of uh, insurance coverage. Got it we basically wanted to come in and just like blow up that whole paradigm. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, you know, we're not aware of any other storage company in the country that covers your items up to $25,000, which is mm -hmm. way more than anyone else is doing, uh, completely just baked in a part of using the service. Um, so we, we very much consider ourselves. The other thing worth calling out is these residential areas where, uh, our hosts exist mm -hmm. are extremely safe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the the break in rates on storage facilities, it's it's according to the FBI, it's something like one in ten storage facilities is broken mm -hmm. into every single year, and that's because they're in these industrially zoned yeah, areas. That's true. You kind of know there there are items there. More than half of all storage facilities don't even have security cameras, mm -hmm. and so they're they're kind of targets. But these these residential areas, on the other hand, there's alarm systems, there's yeah. there's people around, there's dogs, and so they have much lower crime rates. So not only are you getting better insurance protection on neighbor, mm -hmm. completely free, um, but also you're storing in a safer location. Yeah, and I think you brought up a good point because I think one thing we've seen is that a lot of times with these platforms and gig economy companies, you know, there's minimum requirements, but there's also, you know, some basic stuff that you can do to protect yourself either as a host or a renter. So like I'm thinking about it from a host perspective right now, like installing a Simply Safe system, which costs, you know, a couple, two to $300 up front, but then $25 a month going forward, you know, that maybe is a cost of doing business, you know, um, but it also provides your own home with security. Security, right. So I can kind of imagine, okay, I'm making $2,000 a year. I invest in a Simply Safe and it kind of provides that additional security, not only for my personal stuff, but now for the stuff that I'm also protecting, right? Because really, you know, I think what a lot of people get into this gig economy and they don't realize that they're actually now a business owner. And so they have to think about, you know, not only their income, but also their expenses and potential liability. So that's like a really good example to me. And, you know, kind of, uh, we, we don't need to get into all the taxes, but I know that I would, you know, if I was doing that, I would sort of be, I would deduct the percent that I'm using that for my business. You know, I would be able to deduct that on my taxes and offset some of that income from neighbor too which is a cool thing so um i, I actually now that i think about it i said i don't know if you know if you want to share all the details but i'm sure that there's some good tax benefits too if you're renting out a space in your home 
There very much are. And to that point about, you know, taking on liability as a business owner, that is what you're doing as a host. And so not only do we provide that $25,000 guarantee for the renter's items, but we also cover the host up to a million dollars for their general liability as part of being a business. Uh, We're we're kind of the first uh, marketplace that we know of that has come in and protected both sides of the marketplace, Mm. right? You know, you think traditionally like Airbnb, they, they protect the hosts, but the, the tenants don't really bring anything to the transaction. Mm-hmm. Um, same with Uber, like they'll protect the car uh, and the, the driver, but the rider may not bring any items to the transaction. But we actually come in and, and both sides are bringing something to the transaction. Mm-hmm. And so we, we step in and protect both sides of the platform. Uh, and you're right about the tax benefits as well. Uh, We'll have we'll have hosts. There's there's even more affordable options out there. Uh, I don't know if you've seen like the Wise Cams, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that people use. We'll have people buy a, a twenty five dollar uh, Wise Cam and and install it. You know, uh, so for twenty five dollars, you can have basically a video surveillance system watching the items. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of that you can deduct as a business expense. Yeah, uh, yeah. and. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. And yeah, no, I think there's a, again, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the fact that if you sort of really know what you're doing or you're really researching these things, you can kind of really, um, you know, like this could end up, you know, kind of might be reporting a tax loss <laughs> on your taxes that could offset some of your W-2 income even, right? If, but you might actually be making money. So uh, very interesting. Be- because it's in your home, you can actually deduct, you know, the square right. footage percentage of the home that you're using. Yeah. which is is so awesome because, and, and we'll have people write in about this, in America, you pay for the whole square footage of your home, uh, whether you use it or not, yeah. right? It's, it's not a pay-as-you-go square footage. A neighbor allows you to basically uh, get away from that, mm-hmm. right? On the one hand, you can monetize uh, and earn income on the space that you're not using, and on the other hand, you can deduct uh, the expense, the interest expense, yeah. uh, if you're paying a mortgage on that on that square footage that you're not using. And essentially with neighbor, uh, it becomes a pay as you go model where you only ever pay for the square footage that you that you yeah. use in your home. Yeah. So Joseph, I'm, I'm sitting here in my office staring at a huge closet that is completely empty and thinking about all the money that I can make from renting it out. But it also kind of begs the question, this is a marketplace, right? And so there, you know, it, it sounds pretty good from the host point of view. So I guess my question is, you know, what does that marketplace look like from sort of the supply and the demand side? Do you guys have a ton of hosts or do you, you know, wh- where's the uh, sort of, um, you know, I guess I would say like the the, uh, the impediment to growing, <laughs> you know, to millions and millions of uh, users. Yeah, like like the general storage industry, we're definitely supply constrained. Hmm. Um, we, you know, what we think about here at at neighbor headquarters, like day in and day out, is how do we build awareness? How do we get the word out? The those that are searching for storage, hmm. uh, again, they're searching, right? They yeah. they are looking for storage when they need a storage unit. They will. They will go on and try to find a, a storage unit, and we can we can advertise and insert ourselves there, and mm-hmm. and we can show them that not only are we safer uh, and more insured, but we're closer to your home, and we're fifty percent the cost of yeah. this traditional self storage unit. Yeah. Um, so you, the average renter saves two thousand dollars by switching from a, a traditional yeah. self storage unit to a neighbor unit every single year. Yeah. Um, and so those, you know very easy to come by but what uh is more difficult all and i think this is typical of marketplaces is that those hosts they're not searching you know they're not Mm -hmm. they're not searching how do i monetize my garage right and so we have to educate them and build awareness and the more awareness we build across the country the more um those hosts sign up there's not much convincing we have to do of the hosts it's Mm -hmm. really just about creating that awareness as as our brand recognition has grown, you know, especially after, over the last couple of years, we've gotten to the point where we now have active hosts in all 50 states. Oh, cool. um, so again, it's it's not a, really a question of of convincing them of the value. It's it's pretty easy value prop, like just getting you, out there. 
we will monetize the space you're not using and require no work from you. Like it's just a check you're not getting now that you will get in the future. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's awareness. Yeah. And it's interesting. I, ha I had a feeling you might uh, bring up the potential cost savings for the renters. And I mean, I guess I, that, that's sort of what I was assuming on the renter side, you know, you're going to come and use neighbor because you're saving money. And I kind of just did a quick Google search. I found a company here in Los Angeles called CubeSmart. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. I'm, I'm assuming you have. And uh, yeah. just on their website, you know, they've got pricing that, you know, the first thing I pulled up 250 to 400 bucks a month for 10 by 10, all the way up to 10 by 15. And when I pulled up LA, it seemed uh, considerably cheaper. You know, I saw a bedroom 16 by 16 for 65 bucks a month so that's a lot cheaper a garage 18 by 10 for 100 a month um, you know 200 a month so the prices were definitely you know kind of like you said I would I would uh, I would say that yeah it was it seemed about 50 percent cheaper so seems like uh, you guys have good opportunity there on you know customer acquisition and like you said they they hang around for 36 months which I think is pretty uh pretty good, pretty much a good thing in, in uh, um, you know, Silicon Valley. I think a lot of companies struggle with their retention. And uh, so I guess other than awareness, is there any big impediment to, you know, getting more hosts signed up? And, you know, like if like when you talk to hosts, like why are they are, why are they not signing up? Or, you know, I guess if they all are signing up, well, what, what's your kind of biggest opportunity? Like, how do you go and get as many hosts signed up as quickly as possible going forward? Because it sounds like that's a big goal for you. It is. Yeah. And we, and we focus, uh, kind of on anything and everything. Um, we, tr we try to, um, have multiple touch points with mm -hmm. hosts rather than pursuing them on, on one channel. Uh, we just believe in kind of being everywhere and then letting them make the decision rather than trying to, you know, convince or, or force someone by inundating them yeah. on one. Channel. Um, so, you know, we do everything from TV to, to Facebook, to Google, to, okay. to, you know, press, uh, that's Does any one great. channel, uh, worked, uh, best for you guys, I guess in recent months. Oh, um, in recent months, uh, we really had a lot of success. I guess this isn't really a marketing channel, mm -hmm. but, uh, our mobile app, uh, is, is kind of a distribution channel rolling, rolling out our mobile app has been extremely successful mm -hmm. for the business that we're, we're the top ranked storage mobile app mm -hmm. cube smart you mentioned them they're a billion dollar company oh, right wow. public never storage. even heard of them until today <laughs> they're a public storage is a 43 billion dollar company wow. um extra space storage 15 billion dollar company so there are these storage behemoths out there mm -hmm. um and and our mobile app is uh higher ranked than theirs if they even have one Got it. um so so that mobile channel, people have been dying for like a mobile solution mm -hmm. for this. Um, they, that's how we consume things these days. We, we thought the biggest feedback we would get from renters would be that we're so much cheaper than storage. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead, the biggest feedback we've gotten from our renters is just how easy we are. Mm -hmm. They just every NPS score and review we get, it just says like this was so easy. It was like three clicks. Easy, yeah. easy, easy. It's so easy to find a space and book it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely fair. I mean, like I went through Neighbors site and it had definitely had that Airbnb feel, you know, it sort of had that new age, you know, feel of searching and filtering. So if you've ever booked an Airbnb or, you know, called for an Uber, it's going to be very familiar to you. And when I went on the CubeSmart site, man, I'm really picking on these CubeSmart guys. Hopefully they don't email <laughs> me after. Uh, their site looked like basically straight out of the 90s, you know, like little tiny images and little reserve buttons and little slashed off pricing, you know, kind of like a lot of the, the, the marketing 101 schemes from the 90s. So it's definitely interesting to see that uh, juxtaposition there. Um, so very cool to see that you guys are kind of uh, seems like, you know, doing well and kind of, you know, getting out there. I'm, I'm curious to know, sort of, we're obviously in the middle of this uh, pandemic, sort of seems like, you know, I guess we're, I should date it since things are changing so quickly. We're recording May 14th. This episode will come out on uh, Tuesday, um, I think the 19th, but uh, just in case anything happens huge between now and then, uh, how has your business fared in between, um, you know, sort of like since the start of this pandemic? Yeah, that's actually a really relevant question for us. Um, the pandemic has just destroyed a lot of the marketplaces uh, mm -hmm. from, you know, Airbnb to Uber. We've been in a really fortunate position and, and um, nothing that we have done. This is just really an industry thing. Um, storage is actually pretty counter cyclical. Mm -hmm. um, so it does better in recessions. So mm -hmm. the demand for storage has never been better. Just last week, 
again, this is, you know, recording this in May, just last week, we had our best week of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as incoming revenue uh, from renters. And then on the host side, there's never been a greater oppor- you know, greater need to make income from confined to your home uh, than there is now with people experiencing layoffs and unemployment rising. People need income right now. They need to be able to still make those mortgage payments and neighbor provides a way uh, for you to do that. Uh, an article just ran in the U.S. News um, mm-hmm. yesterday, I think, or a couple of days ago, talking about you know how retirees especially need need a way to make income from their homes because they're yeah. essentially home, um, and and they listed neighbor as one of the options of like this is how you can make income. Mm-hmm. And the last you know related to the pandemic is. Any marketplace that's travel related has been essentially been shut down. But that's another unique thing about our marketplace. It's very high vertical, right? There's a reason we're called neighbor, mm-hmm. uh, and and it that's it's 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 not a monetary benefit. But you know when you go stay on a on an Airbnb with a host in Thailand, it's like this great multicultural experience. But you're probably never going to talk to that host again. Yeah. But on neighbor, there's this ex you know, externality, this other benefit that when you're storing with your neighbors, your people that are in close proximity to you, it's an opportunity to build a relationship. And we'll have people write in and tell us, you know, I've lived next to this neighbor for five years and never really said more than hi to them. But I rent their items and they helped me move into their garage. And, uh, you know, we realized that that we actually have a lot of common interests and and they're a Democrat and I'm a Republican and we don't hate each other sort of thing it just it forces people to get to know their neighbors and we think that community building is really valuable yeah that was one thing i was curious about is sort of how the kind of geography of supply and demand lines up because i think one thing that we see you know uh, with uber and lyft for example is that in you know basically where the rides are happening or higher socioeconomic areas you know kind of the downtowns the city centers basically that's where people want rides but if you're making 15 to 20 dollars an hour as an uber and lyft driver you definitely can't afford to live there right i think on airbnb you know the ones who if you own property right it's a little i don't really consider them as much part of the gig or sharing economy since you have to own a house to um you know rent something out generally and so typically you know there's i think more alignment with where demand you know supply is more aligned geographically with demand so it sounds like you're saying uh, i guess i would be curious in a city like let's take los angeles for example because that's where i live or san francisco um, where are most of your hosts living and then kind of where is most of the demand yeah, and, and that's another nice thing about storage is it's it's pretty universally distributed. Mm-hmm. Um, one in ten Americans is currently in a storage contract, mm-hmm. uh, so it's it's widely used. And you'll go to a town that doesn't even it's so small that it doesn't even have a post office, mm-hmm. and it will have two or three storage facilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so our distribution of renters is everywhere. You get people downtown uh, who are, uh, you know, living in a small condo in a high rise and because they don't have a lot of space, they need storage. Right. And you'll get people that live in the suburban areas of the town um, that have some, you know, they have a boat or something. They have toys. Right. They don't have a place to store them. So it's pretty widely distributed. And that's reflected in our host population as well. Mm-hmm. Like if you go to a map in L.A., we have as many hosts in uh, El Segundo as we do in, uh, you know, uh, downtown LA, as we do in uh, Pasadena, as we do, you know, as you get further out, as we do in yeah, I guess that sure. kind of makes sense too, right? Because I guess regardless of whether you live in, you know, the downtown area or the suburbs, right? You kind of still, the storage needs of people and, you know, kind of the tendency for Americans to kind of buy more stuff than they need kind of exists whether you live, you know, downtown or uh, outside in the suburbs. So are there any, uh, you know, big macro trends that you think kind of play, have a big effect on your business? I'm thinking maybe, you know, like a, a couple of years ago, right? There's this whole Marie Kondo movement. I'd love to know what you think about her um, and how that affects 
affects your business or, you know, even stuff like, you know, people, you know, I think there's a lot of reports, people are moving into cities over the next, you know, there's going to be these big mega cities in the next five to 10 years. Um, but at the yeah. same time, you know, housing costs are going up, you know, in places like uh, San Francisco. So sort of a loaded question, but if there's any one or two macro trends you think really affect your business and how you thought about them, I'd be really curious to know. Yeah, we're big fans of Marie Kondo. We think the move <laughs> he's doing is awesome because those people that are that are you know creating those clean spaces in their house, that's all of a sudden an opportunity to monetize that mm. space, right? That that was that was space that was being taken up up by items that did not spark joy for you, mm. but <laughs> uh, but can now you know be bringing you income, like yeah. actual dollars in your bank account. And that does often bring joy, right? <laughs> Dollars, yeah, they, they tend to be correlated with at least a little bit of joy. Yeah. Um, you know, if you really want to get into like long term macro trends, we think that we represent kind of the, the saving company for the storage industry. The storage industry has just fallen behind more and more every year on the supply needs. Mm -hmm. uh, there, last year, I think the storage industry spent five and a half billion dollars just on new construction mm -hmm. for new spaces and they're building all of this space and they just can't keep up every year the demand uh fills all the space they build and more i think the average occupancy right now is in in nationwide is 93 percent mm -hmm. in storage facilities so 93 uh, percent of all units are full which means that most a lot of storage facilities are at 100 percent occupancy right they they literally have no units to offer you and uh, one of the things that we're looking forward to on the horizon, again, this is this is years away, but just kind of shows how yeah. we sometimes think about things is when people are talking about self-driving cars um, and the opportunity to participate in a uh, you know subscription car service, right, mm -hmm. rather than being a car, what that's going to do is it's going to uh, free up a lot of garage space, mm -hmm. and as that garage space is freed up, you know, we as a company can help uh, repurpose that space. And we hope to, you know, one day essentially eliminate the need to spend billions of dollars building all of this new space. Like, let's just use all the yeah. space we have. I just listened to a podcast uh, uh, last week or I, I was watching a video or something where Bill Gates was talking about some of the more serious environmental problems we face. Mm -hmm. Then for a while, you know, the, the big problem we were focused on was was kind of meat production and, and that sort of thing. But he said that's that's largely been solved at this point. There's there's solutions for that with these companies like Beyond Meat and, mm -hmm. and other. Um, he said, as I look forward, the single biggest problem that I don't know how to solve is all of the uh, you know greenhouse emissions that go into concrete and steel production. Hmm. That's the single biggest problem I'm focused on tackling with the environment right now. And we, you know, I, I listened to that and I was like, oh my gosh, concrete and steel, we are building so much storage. There's, there's 2 billion square feet of rentable self storage in the US currently. You could fit every man, woman and child simultaneously uh, in a storage unit um, at the same time, right? Like the, every man, woman, and child in the United States. Mm -hmm. Already as a company, even though we're, you know, we're still a small and growing company, we've offset uh, well over half a billion dollars in, in construction costs that would have needed to occur mm -hmm. uh, if we didn't exist just by onboarding space that already existed. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And I have to say, Bill uh, Gates is turning out to be a very prescient individual. So he's probably someone we should listen to when it comes sure. to uh, all matters of uh, economy, society, or technology. Um, so really appreciate you coming on, Joseph. Uh, if people want to learn a little bit more about Neighbor, uh, maybe check it out as a host, maybe check it out as a renter. I know I'm interested in making a little, I'm always interested in making a little extra money as my audience likes to know. Um, where should they go? Neighbor.com and and you know we're as I mentioned like we are really pushing to meet the storage demand that we have mm -hmm. you know so especially if you have space you know that's what I'd say if you have space in your home Neighbor.com you can download us on the App Store um, right now we're even uh, you know we're giving away Amazon gift card 
you know, if you sign up, cool. if you, cool. if you go to, we set up something for this podcast. If you go to host.neighbor.com, uh, slash, uh, uh, ride share, cool. then, uh, we will give an Amazon gift card to every single host that signs up plus Very send cool. them a swag with a bunch of neighbor stuff. And so we'll get them hooked up. Nice. Hopefully uh, if I sign up using my own code, I'll still get the swag bag and the, and the gift card. <laughs> Um, awesome. Well, we'll leave a link to that in the show notes and, uh, definitely for, um, we'll make sure to mention that too, to everyone that's interested in neighbor. So really appreciate uh, you coming on Joseph and, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Okay. Talk to you soon. See ya.